Uh, our next health law talk. Uh, as you know, this is part of a series, and uh, this one, which I will I'll be introducing our speaker in just a moment, uh, is our second one. And our next one, Robin, is February February twelfth, and uh, it's a a talk on medical tourism, stem cell tourism. It's part of the O'Brien lecture. It'll be very exciting. We'll make sure that you guys, uh, uh, everyone here, can uh, get information about that event. But today, what we're going to talk about uh, is uh, tobacco control. And we're very lucky to have an extraordinary individual to provide this lecture. Now, Stephen Hoffman, I actually have to pull out your CV to do this, is, is truly remarkable. In addition to being, um, are, you, are you 12 and a half years old? Or are you, are you, are you Working on it. Are you a teenager yet? Yeah. <laughs> so he is, he is a, an assistant professor at the Department of Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics at McMaster University, and I was just a guest there just this week. We had a great time. Mm. He's also uh, a fellow, a research fellow of Global Health and Policy at um, the University of Toronto. He's a Knox fellow at uh, Harvard University. He's a visiting professor at Harvard School of Public Health. He's also a fellow uh, at the, uh, the United Nations. Uh, he has published just a ridiculous amount for being a teenager, uh, and he uh, continues to amaze me of all the interesting things that he does. And I love his work. I think we have a lot in common, and I'm flattering myself, and you're probably cringing at the thought. But I do think we have, I, we, we do have a lot in common, because we try to, what we try to do is bring evidence to health policy, evidence to the law. Uh, and he has a real passion for uh, evidence-based work. And just today, in the, I see that you have it. Could you hold it up? I printed it out. Just today, he has a great piece in the National Post taking Dr. Oz to task. Uh, <laughs> the Wizard of Oz, he calls him. Um, and this is just a good example of how he not only does the, the heavy lifting conceptually, uh, the heavy lifting empirically, but he also tries to reach out to the public. Uh, so he's a real advocate of of knowledge translation. So uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here. And by the way, I look forward to years of collaboration. Ah, so thank over you. to you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much uh, for this kind of invitation and that super uh, kind introduction. Uh, doesn't get any better than that. Thank you. I, um, as, uh, as Tim said, uh, much of my research is about uh, using evidence to inform global decision making. And so this talk, what I'm hoping to do is actually raise more questions than answers and hopefully ignite within all of us some, uh, some critical thoughts about, about international law, about global health, tobacco control, uh, hopefully starting um, uh, ideas about future research agenda as well as what we do know based on the evidence now and what we can, how we can inform policy based on that. So for me it's all about, it's more about questions and discussions and I'm going to, hopefully we can have some back and forth as well throughout this talk. Tim um, made me promise that uh, I was not going to present uh, uh, lots of statistics, so I've really tried to, uh, to avoid that, but um, all this work will be, I'll explain, uh, I'll try to explain everything as I go along, and I think it will be, um, well, hopefully we'll have, it'll be fun. So, um, compliance with the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, what influences a state to step up to the plate? So, as a bit of a background, um, we have many global health challenges that the world faces. These are, these are some of them that I've put up there. Now, um, a couple of them, we're in a school of law, faculty of law, so a couple of them I can clearly say we have international laws that address these issues. So we have the international health regulations which address the um, prospects of pandemics. And then we also have, as this talk will be more, mostly about, a framework convention on tobacco control which was recently passed which will um, address issues uh, related to the spread of tobacco around the world. But there's other issues and there's other challenges that need to be addressed. And Law has, is, there's a lot of discussion about how law has addressed those two issues. And so we've recently been seeing lots of calls for other international laws related to various other issues, including all of those. So for example, in this piece in The Lancet, a big medical journal, we have a call for a, a, an international law of some sort to fight fake drugs. In this piece, we have a call for a framework convention on global health broadly. This piece calls for a, an international law related to chronic diseases. Here's one in Nature that calls for a framework convention on alcohol control. Here's one in Lancet again, a call for a framework convention on obesity control. Another one, a proposal for an essential health R&D treaty. And finally, an international, a call for international law to force governments to conduct mandatory impact evaluations in the health sphere. I show these because it seems like in global health and maybe in international law, there's this idea that we have this tool 
this tool being international law. And there's, we can then use this tool to address all of our different challenges. And uh, my concern, which is what motivates me to do a lot of this work, is that I'm concerned that maybe law, we're seeing law as a bit of the golden hammer, that we, we have these problems, we just need to whack them down with the, the tool that we have, rather than consider the full range of, of uh, alternatives. So for me, some of the big grand questions uh, for international laws applied to global health is what might we actually expect new international laws to be helpful? So when might we expect them to be helpful? And then going a bit further, um, do existing international laws even help improve global health? And then one step even more foundational, does international law even matter if we're taking a perspective of, from an outcomes perspective? And these are the big, I think, some of the big questions which we need to problematize, we need to be thinking about as we do our work and as we practice law and practice public health. And I think there's three main reasons why we should really care whether international law really matters. First, law is costly, law can be coercive, and law involves trade-offs. In terms of law being costly, uh, there's certainly direct costs for international law that we often don't think about. It's not just passing a law or even drafting it, ratifying it, enforcing it. Think of, in the international context, think of what this means. It means we're having countless meetings around the world, air travel, legal fees, expensive, duplicative governance structures, new conferences of parties, secretariat, staff, etc. But of course, there's also the indirect costs that we face. So by focusing on one issue and on one tool and one instrument, it means it's occupying resources, energy, and rhetorical space that we're not spending on other areas, which might yield even greater outcomes. And it can distract from other things that we might care about. And there's also indirect legalization costs, which make us really think about, we need to really think about this question of does international law make a difference and is it worth it? Uh, for example, some of those legalization costs is that in law we tend to prioritize process over outcomes. We tend to prioritize consensus over diversity, precedents over research, states over non-state actors, lawyers over health professionals. When I speak to a, a public health or medical audience, uh, they particularly like that one. <laughs> and these aren't necessarily bad, right? I mean, we like, we like focus on process. Uh, often in law we don't know what the right outcome is, so we, spend our, we invest in process in the hope that we get the greatest outcome possible. And lawyers over health professionals, sometimes that's not bad. And precedent over research, well, there's often, there's often good reasons to, to do that. But it's a cost. It, is, it, it can be a cost. And it's something that needs to be considered. International law can also be vague on specific commitments, hard to enforce, and difficult to update. Number two, it can also, the reason why this, really, this question really matters is that law can be coercive. Laws are often imposed by those states that have the most power in our international system. Often new standards are already met by those who are pursuing these laws, and it means that basically uh, the law might oblige poorer states to implement these global policies instead of their own local priorities. And then the promised financial support that's supposed to compensate for that often isn't forthcoming. And enforcement by NGOs can be seen by some as foreign interference in national policy-making processes led by Western leaders, funded by Western donors to whom they're accountable. And third, this question really matters because law ultimately involves trade-offs. If we think of a national budget of a country, there's a cert it's a certain size and we have to spend it accordingly. And that means that every budget decision over to do something or not to do something basically involves a trade-off. International law represents a competing claim. And if we are asking countries to put it as a, a superordinate claim, then we need to, that needs to be justified. Uh, and it needs to be justified with, with very good evidence. So there's this question. The question is, is international law worth it? And the evidence suggests maybe. So in, in a human rights context, which we can learn from when we're talking about global health here, so in a human rights context, the evidence is mixed. So on one hand, we have evidence that human rights treaties can mobilize civil society to demand more, and this can have a great impact on people's lives. But at the same time, we also have competing evidence that says that human rights treaty ratification can actually sometimes be associated with worse human rights practices, although that's probably because um, states that, um, states that are, have poor practices might be just willing to adopt and uh, not worry about implementation. So there's, the data is difficult and problem, problematic, but that's what we're here for. 
And so, of course, those two are good. So, I'm sorry, um, the, human right, the fact that human rights treaties can mobilize civil society suggests that maybe it is worth it, and then the other one says, may, suggests that maybe it's not. And then, equally, the evidence on compliance is also mixed. So, there's evidence is, so does, do people, do states comply with international law? That's also quite mixed. So, some models would explain that states mostly comply when it furthers their own interests whereas other models might explain that states are motivated by principled ideas. So the first one might suggest, well, maybe international law would not have an effect on compliance with those behaviors that the law is trying to encourage. Uh, then again, the other model suggests that states would be, would be influenced by international law in order to comply. So this leads me back to health. So the question is then, if, is, is international law worth it? That's a maybe, right? That's what I've argued. And I'd love your thoughts at some point on that. The question here, though, is, is international health law worth it? And compared to what I just presented about from the evidence from human rights, I think there's actually even fewer reasons to suggest that international health laws might be worth it. Because there's fewer reasons to suggest that states might comply with international law. Health is low politics compared to things like security, nuclear proliferation, existential threats. Uh, economic development, unfortunately. Uh, states are less likely to demand compliance of each other because of that, so the cost for non-compliance is probably lower. And third, there's, in health, unfortunately, we don't have any strong international institutions that can actually com encourage compliance. Um, if we think of those who are familiar with the um, international, the UN system, for example, if you compare the, uh, the tools that the World Health Organization has at, has at its disposal as compared to, let's say, the UN Security Council or the World Trade Organization or the IMF or the World Bank, it's just not comparable. So in my mind, we need to, we need to ask these questions and we need to figure out if international law is worth it. And for me, the first question is a matter of compliance. That's the first, I think, the first step. So does so what are those factors that actually will influence whether states comply and can they be manipulated and can we do stuff good with it? Can we, can we take advantage of that knowledge in order to promote compliance and then maybe build a case for the fact that, or for the question as to whether international law should be pursued as a tool to address these great, these very big global health challenges that we face. So I, want, I don't want to go into the, uh, too many of the details uh, given my promise uh, to Tim, but I'm, the quick overview of the study that I conducted was to look at this exact question of what factors influence whether states comply with the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. So I had to, act, I had to construct a database from um, implementation reports that states are required to submit to the World Health Organization. So this treaty, this Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, it's a treaty that's been ratified by 174 states around the world. And one of the provisions in this treaty is that every state on a biannual basis, every two years, has to submit an implementation report, self-reporting on those provisions with which they're in compliance. So that's, that's the data. And WHO uh, does collate that into a database. Uh, unfortunately, as I was doing this project, we found out that that database was um, filled with errors, and then we did a study which was published in The Lancet after that, but um, to showing what those errors were. But we did have to reconstruct this database and then it allowed us to do various statistical analyses on it. The one I'm going to mainly talk about today is a regression. And basically when I say regression, for those who are unfamiliar with statistics, I was trying to figure out as some factors, as some variables, as some things go up or down, does that lead to more or less compliance with this treaty? So for example, if, if economic growth is higher, or if the country is um, a democracy, Will, so that's, let's say, higher, then does that cause the compliance with the Framework Convention? Is that more likely to lead to compliance from the, with the Framework Convention on tobacco control or not? That's, that, that analysis allows us to do it. So in if for those who do, um, are familiar with statistics in this room, um, the fancy stuff I've put at the bottom. So I, I indexed to create a dependent variable. I used an ordinal probit model. I used multiple imputation for missing data selection model to account for the fact that some countries didn't submit reports. And I used R and a package called Zelig, which was fantastic and I recommend. So here's just a broad overview in terms of um, states that are more and less compliant. So we have at the bottom here, um, I, I prioritized six provisions of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. So I decided that uh, I was going to judge compliance based on states 
self-reporting that they were in compliance with those six provisions. So first thing is, none of the states reported that they were self, that they were compliant with all six provisions. That's interesting in and of itself. Um, few report, reported that they weren't compliant with any, but some did, which suggests maybe some state, well, actually this distribution suggests that states aren't, are being at least somewhat truthful with their self-reports. Um, given um, if they didn't want to be truthful, they would all just report that they were in full compliance, right? Because there's, well, if they're going to mislead, they might as well mislead the whole way. And no, one, no country did that, which is interesting. So the question again is, so what factors influence whether states are in compliance? So I'm trying to figure out what, what, incur, what, are, the thing, what are the characteristics of states that puts them on this side of the graph rather than on this side of the graph. And so I actually wanted to first pose the question to everyone here. When I, was, when I came up with this question, I wanted to make sure that I didn't do what some statisticians, or not statisticians, but some people might do in this, which is um, to run various models, test it out. And if you do this enough times, if you throw in different variables and run the analysis, if you do it enough times, you're going to find significant results simply even just by chance if you, if you do it enough times. I wanted to make sure that didn't happen, so I very, at the beginning I took a very serious exercise of figuring out what are the possible answers that I would want to test for and include in my model, and I only ran the model once as a way to ensure that I'm not playing with the data. So I actually, I, I thought it was a really, it was a really interesting exercise because it made me think about what, what is it that states, about states that might encourage them or not encourage them to comply. And so I thought actually we could, we could do a bit of a exercise here and um, if, those, uh, if anyone has any initial thoughts about this, uh, there certainly are no right or wrong answers. But what might people think? What, what comes to mind? Yeah. Taxation of tobacco products, government revenue from tobacco products. Yeah, definitely. So if the government's dependent, if the government gets a lot of its budget, um, if a lot of its budget comes from tobacco taxes, then uh, it has a huge incentive to not uh, take action and reduce tobacco consumption. Tim? Uh, an existing regulatory framework. Yeah, definitely. Nice. Yeah, yep. In tobacco, agricultural uh, industry in Canada. Definitely. Nice. <laughs> Any others? I think, yep. Maybe an age of cooperation. Interesting. Nice. And in what, um, in what way? How would that uh, Mm. Ah, that's so. Uh, I didn't. So I didn't think of median age, but it's an interesting one, especially now. Um, now I, I know the results. You don't, but uh, knowing the results, that's an interesting. Uh, it's an interesting idea. Maybe I should have thought of. <laughs> Great. Any other? Any other thoughts? Yes. In the mm. Nice. Definitely. So that also speaks to uh, the tobacco. The in the. Uh, the size of the tobacco industry in any country. So one was about the production of tobacco, another one was the actual, let's say, manufacturing industry of the companies. Yes? In the case of undemocratic countries, level of political stability in that country. Yeah. Some, some dictators don't want to anger the population by uh, suddenly restricting their access to a drug they're addicted Yeah. Nice. So you're actually throwing in a potential interaction between, uh, between those dimensions, which I, I did not do for uh, various reasons, but that's a great idea as well. Yes? Percentage of smokers within the Yep. Nice. So smoking prevalence. Nice. Great. So there's lots of, lots of possible, lots of possibilities. Now, of course, the problem is when doing these uh, studies, uh, I would love to put in a variable about, let's say, democracy. But, uh, so how democratic is a country? And there are indices to do that, but there's only, there's only indices. There's not a real measure of many of these things. Data is patchy. Data is wrong in many cases, and ultimately we're building, we're trying to build models that are not, well, they're simplifications, that's the helpfulness, that's why models are helpful, because they allow us to abstract from reality. So there's always limitations. These are the ones that I came up with, which many of which um, were mentioned here. So for me, I was interested in population size, the economy, level of development, uh, which I use the Human Development Index. I was interested in civil political freedoms, I was interested in measuring NGO advocacy. So how important is it that there's NGOs within a country that are so anti-tobacco NGOs that might influence um, 
I thought that might influence government, especially in light of uh, evidence about human rights treaties. Tobacco farming, as was mentioned, tobacco consumed, uh, social equality, um, respect for the rule of law, smoking prevalence, both for adults and youth. And I was interested also, I thought maybe if health was a government priority, then maybe it would, maybe that would suggest they would they might prioritize uh, compliance with this particular treaty. So I used uh, the percentage of the national, health bu the national budget that went to health. And then I also thought just maybe there's some tobacco controls that might exert their influence more. So I tested for whether, for who, who was, for which company was the dominant player in, in every country. So I thought that might, that might have something to do with it. So the results are, when I, when I did this analysis, is that the factors associated with more compliance were development, so that's not much of a, that's not much of a surprise. So those countries that had a higher human development index uh, score were, that was, the, that was the number one thing associated with compliance. Uh, also surprisingly though was, that, or I guess quite excitingly, uh, anti-tobacco, the presence of anti-tobacco NGOs within countries was, was also uh, associated. So the more NGOs there were, that were working against, toba or against tobacco and, or for controlling tobacco, um, the more likely states were to be in compliance with their international legal obligations in this area. And the prevalence of adult smokers, so more adult smokers meant more compliance. I'm not exactly sure what that means, particularly given that factors associated with less compliance, one of them was the prevalence of youth smokers. So for some reason we have the situation where the prevalence more adult smokers meant there was more likely, it was more likely that states were in compliance with the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, and more youth smokers meant that a state was less likely to be in compliance. Uh, it might influence, um, it might mean about who has power in different countries. Um, anyways, that's an interesting question. And the other one was um, tobacco industry market share, so not surprising, the larger the tobacco industry was in a country, the less likely a state was going to be, was to be in compliance. And interestingly, I don't know what's, this might just be by chance, but if the country's leading tobacco company was Philip Morris, as opposed to all the other companies, then that country was less likely to be in compliance. Uh, I have not looked into their lobbying budgets or anything like that. I'm not sure what's going on there, but I certainly um, plan to. <laughs> And so in terms of interpreting the results, it's interesting that there's some overlap between the factors that we found um, for what influences compliance with human rights treaties um, as to with the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And um, so those would be, for example, development and NGO advocacy. That was something that was very much highlighted in um, Beth Simmons' uh, recent book on mobilizing for human rights. And uh, it's also interesting that maybe when we're thinking of compliance with international law, Maybe we can't think generically across issue area because in this case, it wasn't just a question of, because there were issue specific factors that seemed to be important, it seems that we can't just think broadly about whether international law will encourage compliance with its provisions, but maybe there's specific things within each sector, whether it's health, the environment, or security, that need to be considered. So I think we, this really, at least for me, highlights that we need to be thinking of international law, not just broadly about all types of international law, but also specifically within different sectors and how within it could have different impacts on different sectors. And so for the examples with this would be prevalence of smoking and um, the industry lobby, which might not exist in others. There's a question. Yeah. I'm sorry, the population? population yes, yep. Yeah, so it, it, it could. Um, so I haven't, I haven't thought of whether because there's more youth compared to adults, whether that would have an impact um, in that. Mm. No, but it's, it's, a good, it's a good question because it also, I, was, I guess I was thinking also about um, who votes. So um, youth, this would be under 18. So those, mo in most countries, well, in those countries where they're 
our elections, um, elections with choices. Uh, youth are um, usually not allowed to vote, so maybe they're a less important constituency, but they seem to, yeah, no, I'm not sure what's going on there. I think it, I, I was thinking of elections and voting power, but maybe that's another way to look at it too. That's great, yeah. If you have a lot more children smoking, there's a lot less compliance with the rules. Mm. So that, that may explain a lot of the correlation. Oh, I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. Yeah, no, so that, that could definitely, uh, yeah, that's probably, yeah, that's really good. Thank you. Okay, let me um, continue. So um, in terms of, I think the depressing part of the story, well, not depressing, but the unfortunate part of the analysis of the results is that the most important factor, by far, in terms of, um, I could show you the, all the coefficients and the numbers, but the most important factor, by far, was the extent of development of a country, as measured by the Human Development Index. So the higher developments countries, the state, state countries were at, the more likely they were to be in compliance. And unfortunately, development's tough. Development is challenging, and it's not something that we can tweak in order to quickly improve compliance with the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. But it's something, it does suggest that maybe in order to encourage compliance with these types of socially oriented international laws, maybe we need to take an integrated approach across sectors and uh, improve the entire state of a, of a country um, simultaneously. And also I think these study results do raise some interesting questions about this youth, adult youth smoking prevalence issue as well as the Philip Morris uh, question or not so much about Philip Morris but about the role of the tobacco industry. Yes? So is there any way you can figure out whether the correlation with Philip Morris is because Philip Morris is influencing governments or because Philip Morris decides to target its marketing in countries that are non-compliant countries? Because that, 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 would, that would also explain yeah. why, why there's that correlation. Definitely, although um, one would, uh, so, so Philip Morris might be pursuing that, that particular strategy, although presumably other companies would do that as well, so the likelihood of, of yeah, so you're right, or, or they might have started that strategy earlier, which uh, is certainly, um, so is there, there was talk about. Uh, with, uh, well, with, with time series data, you could. So if you look at this over time, and if, um, unfortunately with this variable, I don't think I ha there is time series data. I think it's sort of at a particular point the, um, for who, which company had the greatest market share across all 100 and all the different countries, 100 and I guess in, uh, 74 countries that have ratified this treaty. So I don't think that would be possible, but maybe there's other ways. It's a great question. It's a great idea. Great. And so I did want to conclude this part in terms of by saying that I think it does though point to two strategies. So I told you sort of the depressing part which is that development is complicated and then if that's the primary driver of whether, not primary, but the most important driver of whether states are in compliance with this international treaty, it's sort of a difficult one to actually do anything with. But fortunately there are actually two other strategies which can and which were shown to make a difference. Um, or at least be associated with the difference, and um, which we can do something about, which is supporting NGO advocacy and limiting the tobacco industry's influence. Uh, so that's maybe two things, which are obviously are being pursued right now, but it provides, it does suggest an opportunity where if we're serious about this issue and we care about countries being in compliance with the, f with the tobacco control provisions, then this might be the, where the opportunities lie. Ultimately though, I think this, this study that I talked about and these questions that I'm asking and hopefully we can have a great discussion with in a, in a couple of minutes, I feel like this is all part of a very unfinished agenda which suggests there's lots of opportunities for additional research in this area. I think one of the big questions is how these results about the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control compare to other international laws. It's, is this unique? Is, so is health unique? Is tobacco control unique? or the broader things that we can learn. And it is interesting from that perspective that there were similarities in results, or some similarities in results between, in this analysis, and previous ones that had been done uh, on human rights treaties. So, but I think it's still part of a, it's an unfinished question that we need to answer. 
Also, I think we need to figure out what actually causes states to go from non-compliance to compliance. Here, what I was doing in the regression, what it does is it's looking at these relationships and it's controlling for various factors. So you're, you're comparing different states and their different levels of compliance while controlling for different factors that might be important. But you obviously can't control for everything. You can never control for everything, which, which is the advantage of things like time series data, which uh, was mentioned. Um, so we, and that's, it's a slightly different question about what factors influence whether states are in compliance versus watching over time as we see the, as, as the years, um, as we can watch who is in compliance and who's changing compliance with this treaty. It's a different question to ask, what actually causes a country to switch or to improve their record? And you could also ask the flip, are there countries that are, um, where their record is going down in the, in the wrong direction that we might like? So, um, and what would cause that? So there might be factors, and that's an interesting question. Does compliance even have an effect on a law's overall impact? That's, I'm assuming that. So my, this whole, much of this presentation was focused on compliance and whether states are in compliance. But should we even care? Because if it doesn't have an impact, maybe, maybe we don't care. Maybe we still do. And then are international laws worth their costs? Which I think is, is my big question that's really been motivating me in all this work. So I'd, I do want to, definitely want to have a, a great discussion about this. I thought to sort of kickstart a, um, the discussion. I thought I would maybe propose some ideas I'm still working with about um, when I think about whether international law is worth its cost. And, and in my mind, the next sort of question is, well, yes, we need to seriously think about that, but then how do we guide states and NGOs going forward who might decide that they want a treaty, they want to advocate for a treaty on this issue or that issue? And so in my mind, I've been, and in my research, I've been really trying to think uh, of a criteria for international health laws and propose something. So I'd, uh, I'd love to propose that uh, or share with you my initial thinking so that that can also maybe kickstart some great discussion. So in my mind, I see four main criteria or proposed criteria for when we should have new international health laws. So for a new international health law, for my mind, to be justified, I would say that the problem needs to be transnational and timeless and the nature of the solution needs to justify the coercive dimension of law and it has to ultimately be worth its cost. So in terms of transnational, what I mean is that I think that if in order to have an international law, to, for an international law to be justified, I think the problem needs to involve multiple states, it needs to transcend national borders, and it has to have cross-border effects or else we could just stick with domestic national law. Second, in terms of timeless, I think the problem does need to be timeless because law, in many respects, petrifies our approach to the issue and laws, when written, are often very difficult to revise or withdraw. So I think the problem it needs to be expected to last a long time and not limited to any particular circumstances, as there's, again, alternative instruments that are available to address those issues. Third, in my mind, I would say that the solution, so international law, would need to justify coercion, the coercive element. So it needs to address multilateral challenges. It has to resolve collection acts of problems, collection collective action problems. It has to correct the underprovision of global public goods or, or advance subordinate norms. There has to be some justification, really good justification, in order to have the coercive elements of international law. And fourth, ultimately, I think it needs to be worth the cost, which means we need to think about what those costs are, and we need to evaluate those benefits and its costs as compared to competing alternatives, of which there are many. So, those are the four in my, in my mind, um, which uh, I think a lot of my research is suggesting. But I would love your thoughts on that. I'd love your thoughts on the tobacco control um, work that I presented or anything else. So in conclusion, I think that international law is costly, which means its use has to be justified based on its impact. I think that the FCT compliance, it, well, my study shows that FCT compliance was higher among those states with higher development and more anti-tobacco NGOs and that states with larger tobacco industry had lower compliance, which we talked about. And ultimately, if there's one point I can convey in this presentation, it's that I think we still need to learn when international law should be used and when alternatives may be more appropriate. Thank you. So if people have questions, I'm sure they do. Mm. Um, uh, we have uh, lots of time, which is awesome, and I have a couple questions too. So we'll start with uh, Ubaka. Thanks. Uh, for the presentation. Uh, so my question relates to 
the, the premise of your presentation, which is uh, the question you asked about whether international law is worth it. Yeah. And um, I think your presentation does suggest that the primary role of law in this context is to produce some outcome. Now, that means that law is necessarily viewed as a, as a means to an end. I know from being at the University of Toronto uh, and you know, talking to about international law scholars, who contemplate the of international law, that there's a lot of resistance to the idea that the role of law in this context is outcome, should be outcome driven. They basically think it relegates law to the role of the handmaid, you know, especially in threats like politics, political expectations, economic expectations. So how would you respond to that view? Do you think there's something to be gained from just the process of deliberation that law creates, uh, even if there's no outcome necessarily? Sure, although I think um, we sort of asked uh, in the question, um, is it worth, is the deliberation helpful? So is there an outcome from the deliberation that's not an outcome? So I, so yeah, so I, I think there are, um, so I think deliberation is always debate is helpful. I mean, well, I'm, I'm an academic. I, I believe in the, the marketplace of ideas and I, I believe that, um, well, I'm also a lawyer, so I believe that uh, two people arguing out and uh, hopefully the truth will emerge. Uh, so I believe in all that and deliberation is a, I think is a very important part of it. But I think, I'm, I'm still talking about outcomes in my mind. Um, I, it might be my public health background that doesn't allow me to get out of that outcomes focus. But I think ultimately, um, when we talk about costs, and international law is costly. There are trade-offs, it's coercive. These are, I don't think it, we should think of it as something that's, oh, we can try it out. If it doesn't work, that's okay, because there's no costs, because there are costs. So in my mind, whenever there's costs, we always need to think about benefits and figure out whether the costs um, are worth the benefits and the benefits worth the costs, in my mind. I'd love other people's thoughts on that. Though. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll just follow up actually on that. I mean, I think one of the ideas is that if we start on the treaty track too soon, then we're going to end up with something that's not as worthy or not as effective as mm. we hope it will be. And this is, I think, the major concern with a lot of the issues that are being raised at this point. Is it really time to start the negotiations or are we still in a soft law declaration type phase? So I think it would be interesting and I'd be, um, if you have any thoughts on how do we know when to go from one to the mm -hmm. other? How do we know when we're ready? Is it just about the money? Is it about the normative sort of domestic laws that are already in place? Which leads me to my second question, which is a lot of people think that the framework convention on tobacco control, even if it, even if states are compliant with it, they're the ones that were already complying with the sort of things that they were looking for anyway. So they already had domestic legislation in place, um, or there was already norm shifting in those countries. Um, and the countries that are not compliant with it um, are the ones that weren't to begin with. So it really hasn't made a, sh a big shift in terms of what was going on in, in, um, in those countries. So what are your thoughts on yeah, oh, so both really great questions. The, um, in terms of um, it causing a shift to actually having an impact, no, I think it's a live question about whether, whether the treaty has actually caused any shift within countries. Because you're right, the countries that are in compliance, they might have already been in compliance before the treaty was ratified or adopted and ratified. They, um, alternatively, even if they weren't already in compliance, they might have been going in that direction anyways. And they might have by now basically been in compliance with provisions even if those provisions didn't exist. Now I think it's a live question. Fortunately, as we, we can watch countries and as we continue to get these implementation reports every year, hopefully we can then start to study, use, use empirical tools to study what actually causes those countries that are changing from non-compliance to compliance and what, so we can tease that out, what it, what it actually is. So I think it's a question we can't yet answer but I anticipate in the next couple of years, we, we now have we're on round, round three of client compliance reports. Maybe once we have round four in two years from now, we have four data points for countries and we can then maybe tease out um, using some more interesting methods. But, um, and then the first, yeah? Oh, no, go ahead, sorry. I was gonna say in the first question about um, soft, um, oh, when, to, when do we know to go to, to hard law? Yeah, I think, I think it's an you're sort of assuming that we do have to go to hard law eventually. If soft law works, so if declarations or other instruments work, then uh, maybe that's uh, what we should do, especially because they seem like they're less costly. Uh, I don't know, I think it depends. And I think that's why a criteria is really important. This is just my I initial ideas, 
but I, yeah, I definitely agree it's an important you question. Guys, you guys, I'm going to force you, because I have a similar question. Oh, uh-oh. What do you, I'm going to force <laughs> you to, do you think it's worth it? Do, a, a, do you think it's work, working and having an impact? And given your tough criteria, I didn't hear a slam dunk quote in this context whether you think it's worth it. Uh, so tobacco, if you know, tobacco control was, was decided to be the, the second international health law because they thought that that was the most natural one given the, um, particularly the illicit markets that are involved in tobacco. So to, one of the biggest problems with tobacco control is that individual countries often can't regulate the tobacco industry because it, these companies are truly working across borders. And w even, even when states do try to control what's happening within their own borders. There's so much tobacco flooding in through illicit means in black markets. Uh, they argued that it needed a truly global approach. So in a sense, it was a transnational problem. I guess they assumed that, that tobacco consumption is a timeless issue. Maybe it's public health issue, um, effects justify coercion. And then maybe it's worth the cost. Um, so I'm not sure, um, I go, although I would suggest that of the various, at the beginning I highlighted all those different calls for new international health laws. Of all of them, it seems like tobacco control might have been the good one to start with. Uh, it does make more sense. Most of those that I highlighted to you, I wouldn't, I don't, I wouldn't support. Um, but um, I think that one, if we were going to try it out, maybe that might be the one to do. Okay, two questions back here. Huh. In a sense, my question was actually, my, my question was, what is the transnational dimension of, of, of tobacco? Well, why should I care when there's something, not, not, not as a moral sense, but why should Canada care if a man in China gets, gets uh, cancer? And why should China care if a man, if a woman in Canada gets cancer, right? Uh, what is the international dimension? You, you've talked about smuggling as the reason. That would seem to be a justification for local regional treaties. Again, not for an international Yeah, and it also suggests for maybe a treaty related to smuggling rather than specifically a treaty on tobacco. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. And I've, um, there was a, to that call, that call I highlighted about a framework convention on alcohol control that was in Nature. I'd, uh, I wrote and, um, a reply to it that was published in Nature where I argued exactly that point that um, alcohol, yes, of course, it's something that there's black markets for it, but ultimately it's something that can be made in anyone's bathtub, so it's not, that wouldn't be the driving, I don't think it's sufficiently justified. Um, I don't think it was sufficient for argument um, to justify uh, the coercive and the costs elements of international law. Tobacco is just a bit more complicated because, well, we can't just make it in our bathtubs. Yeah, so there is that element where much of the problem does depend on the smuggling. But yeah, you're right, I agree. I definitely agree. I, I Mm. Because that would, I think, shed some light on whether or not the, uh, the treaty actually makes a difference. So we could do that. Um, the problem is there's, um, this is one of the most widely adopted treaties in the world. So 174 countries so we have... have well, if we're looking within the UN system, we'd have um, something like 19 countries. So it'd be 174 countries mm -hmm. comparing their trajectory versus the 19 countries. We could do it. Um, the problem then would be, to, because they're not reporting on their data, we would then have to manually collect that implementation data, which um, was certainly beyond the scope of my, uh, my abilities and resources. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question and also might um, help, if, if someone did do that, it would help answer the question that uh, generally mentioned about the impact of these things. Yeah. So I'm gonna ask, I'm jump in again, I apologize. <laughs> I wanna go back to the back this question and because uh, I think it's a really good one. It's one that a criticism that sort of some of our work always gets, you know, because I'm all about you know, empirically based, you know, evidence based policy. Yep. But you know, we hear this a lot, right? Back, you know, but a lot of these laws have sort of a symbolic value, right? Whether it's a human rights law, and even though you can't trace it to exact action or a measurable action that can be empirically, te empirically tested, over the sweep of history, it'll have a profound impact. How do, how do you respond to those? Because that wouldn't really fit into your. Your, your grid there, right, to your four criteria, sort of this broad symbol. We're, we, the world, are making a statement about the evil of tobacco, period. Yeah. I guess in, in my mind, if that's the goal, if the goal is to make those sort of statements, which are really important, and I, I'm a true believer I'm not sure in all. they are. I'm curious. Uh, well, I, I think they're, I, I do believe they're important. Um, I think language matters. I think symbols matter. Um, 
I, norms matter. But I don't think they necessarily have to be law, especially um, when we have alternative instruments like declarations, like uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for example, or there's other, there are other mechanisms that we can use to achieve the same symbolic goals, or mostly achieve that goal, without many of the costs that are involved. So I guess in my, in my mind, I can't get over this idea of, um, of co looking at costs and benefits. And I think, I think everyone in this room should be thinking more along those lines as well. Uh, law is costly. It's, it's, super, it's extremely effective where, for those areas where it works. And uh, we would, though we want to make sure, especially with international law, something that's affecting the whole world, we want to make sure that it actually is going to work, or at least it has the prospect of having benefits that out, um, outnumber the costs. I have one more before I let you go. Uh, yeah. Oh, I, I have a question oh, for you. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Yeah. I'm just wondering about divorces for patients uh, in the countries that you're serving, and what's the situation with that? Definitely, and fundamentally, the treaty was was about that issue. I mean, it was a it was a global health treaty that was adopted under the auspices of the World Health Organization. So it is very much uh, a health treaty. Um, I guess there's this there is the open question though of whether it has any impact on whether it has any health impact. And so I guess in my mind, the very that that's a really difficult question to answer. Um, and in my mind, the first sort of mechanism to help answer that is. Does the international law have any effect on government policy, which is how the international law might affect people's health? Now, um, there are, of course, other mechanisms, which I'm, so for example, um, people might hear about, oh, there's this framework convention on tobacco control, and it might inspire them to make a difference, to change their own individual behavior. So that could be another mechanism it could work. In my mind, in this study that I presented, I'm assuming the treaty would only have a health impact if it's promoting compliance with its provisions. Um, and those provisions are all health promoting provisions. Yeah. Yes. And so that would build on the NGO advocacy. The presence of a treaty, uh, well, according to Beth Simmons's work on human rights, it gives a platform for NGOs to, or it gives a focal point uh, to, for NGOs to rally around um, and to, and it gives them a stronger rhetoric in order to make claims. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So just following up on this question, I mean, did you think about looking at what the country's commitment was to universal health care, like how much they were spending on cancer patients and what they might have anticipated saving as a result of compliance? That's a really good idea with cancer um, patients. I'm not sure that data is available, but uh, it's something that's a really great idea. I did. That's a great question, at least. But even the correlation with the national health system. Well, I did include um, health, the proportion, the percentage of a country's budget, national budget, that went to health. I used that as sort of an indicator for how much a country prioritizes health, as opposed to all the other things that a country can so spend. Public money or is public money? Not U.S. money. Not uh, like the U.S. Is, invests more than any country in the world in health, and they have, don't have a national system. Correct. So would they be ranked higher though on your scale? Um, well, they still spend uh, enormously much, on, uh, yeah, they, they probably, the government still spends enormously on health, but um, you're right. So private expenditure on health would not be part of that. Okay. But I also wasn't looking at private action. I was looking at government behavior. So okay. I, uh, I thought that was. Yeah, well, uh, although it's so limited, which countries have which countries have that. And um, I guess of the 174 countries I was focused on, um, probably very few have that level of data. But it's a great idea for the future. And points to the need for, for data and to invest in data infrastructure and data architecture. And it points to the, the, po the range of possibilities that statistics can have, and, and, and various empirical methods, qualitative, quantitative, can have on answering these questions. And it's something, um, 
uh, well, I'm in, a, I'm in a law school, so I'll be provocative here. Um, it's something I think lawyers and legal scholars often don't focus on in, in their research. Um, it's one I'm not, for example, if one looks at, uh, in a school of public health, the proportion of researchers who are doing empirical research would be much higher than the proportion of law professors in law faculties who are doing empirical research, empirical legal research. So that proportion, uh, maybe, that's, maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong. Um, I guess I'm arguing uh, that uh, maybe we should have a bit more empirical research because of the huge potential that you're pointing to. Yeah. No, you're, you're pointing to the, um, this idea that um, there's huge causal pathways that go from, um, well, let's say something like an international treaty to where there's someone actually gets lung cancer, which is the thing we care about, why we care about smoking. Um, and there, and, oh, I, I completely agree. Um, there was a, a study that was done about the impact of human rights treaties on population health, and they, they sort of decided to ignore everything in the middle as well. And, um, I think that that study, for example, was, was problematic. I'm, I'm supervising a student right now who's looking at that, that relationship and trying to, instead of looking at its treaties impact on someone's personal health, trying to figure out the stages in the middle that might have an influence. So looking at government policy, for example, looking at whether that pol government policy is actually implemented on the ground, then looking whether that program on the ground actually has an impact. So breaking it up a bit might help. It's, um, it's a problem with this very macro type research, but it's still, the macro research can still point to strategies which might be more effective than competing alternatives. Yeah. Great. I do have a question, do we have a couple minutes left? Sure, couple minutes. Great. I do have a question for everyone. What do, you, what do you think about a, a criteria for international health law, or maybe a criteria for any, any international law before we pursue it? Um, am I missing anything? Do you disagree? Or what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Mm. If you add it that, because there's a, a, a huge discomfort in the community with the notion that what they do or what they're interested in, um, most person are not before it can be measured. Mm. So I think you'll feel right. Yeah. But I do agree that the criteria is this. Yes. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I, I would want you to break down justifies coercion mm. into, into something. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not sure how you're going to answer that question justifies coercion. Like, I'd want to see. It's almost like a section one, maybe, kind of analysis. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. I would actually just hold it into uh, justify the cost, because one of the costs of law is that you have to coerce people. Right. So, I mean, that's, yeah. that's really the cost of your talking about. Yeah, I like that. I guess in my mind, when I, I agree with you, um, I knew justifies coercion, that doesn't mean anything. So I, these are the ones, I listed them as just uh, sort of commas right now. Um, in the paper that I've written on this, uh, the, I think these are the ones, this I think is a complete list these examples here, but I wouldn't dare say it's a complete list uh, until I'm more comfortable with this. Uh, these are just initial thoughts. But I feel like um, the only way to justify coercion in this context is if it actually addresses a multilateral challenge, which so something that can't happen within, so the problem can't be addressed within one country. There has to be some sort of collective action problem or else, well that's because that's the comparative advantage I think of international law. It needs to correct the under, -prov under provision of global public goods, which is related to the previous point or it has to advance a subordinate norm, like, um, like if we say that um, uh, freedom from torture is a, might be a subordinate norm, which we might then decide to be coercive, and that's worth it. So that would be, I think that would be all of them in my mind, but I would definitely love discussion on that. Uh, your experience. first category there actually the subcategory under number one, so the number three? Yeah. Uh, yes, except, yeah, well, yes, but, um, I, number three was talking about the solution rather than the um, the niche of the problem, but uh, I should think more about that. I like that. There you need to actually put in, I mean, sort of restate, in a sense, the international element that justifies coercion that you have to do with the concept of justifying coercion. I mean, normally we would just say, okay, well, if there's 
harm or, you know, um, but it seems like by bringing back the transnational element there, that you maybe need some qualification of coercion in order for, for that to be um, understandable. Yeah. No, I like that. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. All okay, right. Nice. Well, I'm gonna, I know people have classes to get to, so I'm going to bring it to a close here. And, and you know, it is really wonderful to have a person like uh, Stephen come visit us. He's incredibly busy. You know, he's traveling all over the world you know, to his various posts at the UN and Harvard and McMaster. And, and I, I know how phenomenally busy he is. Um, you know, Stephen, uh, I, I, in preparation for this uh, talk, I actually looked at. And so I know how old Stephen is. Uh, he's not 12, but he's close. <laughs> and uh, I checked what my CV looked like when I was your age, and it had one line on it, dishwasher, Dewey's. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I know you're a rising star, so, uh, so we look forward to seeing where you go. Uh, Thank you. Remember, remember that we have uh, these two great talks coming up, February 12th, the O'Byrne Lecture. It's, uh, we're bringing in Glenn Cohen from uh, Harvard, and YY Chen from U of T. Uh, and myself, and we're going to talk about uh, tourism, medical tourism, and then there's going to be a really fun uh, Cafe Scientifique uh, at Leva, one of my favorite spots, uh, where we're also going to talk specifically about stem cell tourism. Um, and it'll be a fun sort of interactive uh, event, and there's going to be four of us there, uh, and thanks to Ubaka, who is, is leading this, and is going to be chairing that event. So thank you very, very much for taking the time to come, and thanks again, Stephen. Thank you.